In today's society, couples tend to have children much later in life. This can lead to an increasing number of difficulties when trying to conceive. So much so that it's led to a growth in demand for treatment of subfertility. Dr. Alison Taylor is a fertility consultant at the Lister Hospital. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Alison. First of all, can you remind us about the main reasons why couples have difficulties having a baby? Sure. We can broadly think of them as reasons from the male partner's point of view, from the female partner's point of view, the couple together. And if we think about the male partner, then it really comes down to problems with the semen sample or sperm count. And that can be either there are small numbers of sperm there, they're not moving very well, or there's a high number of abnormally shaped sperm. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, it might be that the man has been born with a problem like the testes didn't come down properly at birth, or there might be a genetic reason why the testes aren't producing sperm properly, um, or there might have been something that's happened since he's been born, perhaps some infection that's caused some damage, or he might have had to go through some medical treatment for cancer, such as radiotherapy or chemotherapy, that's caused some damage. But in the majority of cases where there is a sperm problem, actually we don't often know what the underlying problem is. On the female side of things, um, then there can be problems with the woman not producing an egg regularly, not ovulating, or she might have a problem with her fallopian tubes, so they might have become damaged perhaps by infection in the past and become blocked, so they're not collecting and picking up the egg properly when it is released each month. And how would you find that out? I mean, how would you detect the problem in the fallopian tubes? You'd have to investigate that with um, a test to, to see whether the tubes are open, which can either be an X-ray based technique or ultrasound based technique or um, an operation called a laparoscopy. But in all of them, you put some dye through the tubes and watch it coming out of the ends of the tubes. There are some other female reasons why um, partners may be, uh, why couples may be having difficulty getting pregnant, and they also include um, problems with the uterus. So um, women who have significant fibroids in in the wall of the uterus can have difficulty getting pregnant, and there's also a condition called endometriosis, which can cause damage and scarring in the pelvis, and that also can make it difficult for couples to conceive. And then there can be problems between the couple themselves um, when they're trying to um, have sex. It may not be happening very often or it may be happening but not appropriately timed within the cycle at the woman's most fertile time um, in her, her, her menstrual cycle. And then there's a group um, which is about 20% of couples where no obvious cause is found and we sometimes call that unexplained subfertility. So what would you do, what's the next step if you cannot explain the fertility problem? Um, well, it depends a little bit on the age of the couple and how long they've been trying. If they haven't been trying for more than three years, then actually there's a really good chance that they could get pregnant naturally, and it can be up to 70% of couples will get pregnant without any particular intervention at all. But many couples have been waiting longer than that or have reached the point where um, t they feel time is running out, perhaps because the woman is a little bit older. And in those um, situations, usually we will advise moving on to some form of assisted conception treatment, which might be one of the simpler treatments, like intrauterine insemination, where we're taking a sperm sample from the male partner, concentrating the best sperm together, and then placing it through the cervix into the uterus at the time the woman releases eggs from the ovaries. And at that stage there are no drugs involved? Yeah, well you can either do it without drugs in the woman's own natural cycle and the recent um, national guidelines recommended doing um, insemination in natural cycles but there is no doubt that actually if you use some drugs to stimulate the ovaries the success rates are a little better than if you do it in natural cycles without stimulation. Now, there's been a lot of press about the dangers of using drugs, fertility drugs. Um, what do you say to people who have obviously been quite desperately trying for mm. a baby for many years? Could you, could you give us the, your version of, of how sure, safe are they? Sure. I mean, I think it's worrying for patients because it is very commonly in the press, these, these scare stories about risks of cancer following um, treatment, and, and no one wants to think that they're going to put themselves at significantly increased risk of, of, of major problems like cancer. The, um, what I can say is that most of the studies that have been done to date are generally reassuring, and that there aren't suddenly big increases in risks of breast or ovarian um, cancer following fertility treatment. What's difficult is that patients who've never achieved a pregnancy in, uh, in themselves 
have a slightly higher risk of having breast and ovarian cancer anyway. And having a pregnancy seems to be protective. So actually, if we can give some treatment that then results in a pregnancy, their risk may in fact go down. With some of the simple um, oral tablets, something called clomiphene, there has been a study that has suggested that very long-term use beyond a year or more than 12 cycles of treatment might be associated with a small increase in um, the risk of ovarian cancer. Um, so we tend to now um, be perhaps a little more cautious than we were in the past and recommend a more limited number of treatment cycles and then moving on to other treatment if it hasn't worked, for example, after six to nine months of treatment. But we are flexible and we'll look at each couple you know, individually. Now, are there any other ways of treating ovulation problems? We've talked about the drugs, but uh, could you go more specifically into what can be done without the invasive um, introduction of uh, drugs? Well, um, the... The simplest place to start usually actually is looking at a woman's weight and um, for some women if they are significantly overweight or significantly underweight just simply getting their weight near the correct range for their height can be enough to get them ovulating naturally which is obviously always the best way because then they can just go off and try and conceive without any more medical intervention. So women that are significantly overweight we always start with trying to get them to lose weight. Um, obviously that's easier said than done often, yes. but, but um, um, with encouragement some women can be very successful if they're motivated enough and can have very good results without needing any drugs at all. And of course being underweight is a problem as well, isn't it? It, because it can be. Because periods can cease and uh, Absolutely right. a woman's body is in the right state to conceive. Yes, and even if the periods don't stop altogether, there can be that there aren't quite enough of the hormones around to really stimulate ovulation to occur effectively each month. So, so yes, again, if somebody is underweight or is perhaps exercising very markedly, um, then we might advise them to try and gain weight. Um, apart from using the, the simple um, clomiphene tablets that we were mentioning earlier, which actually are a very effective way of um, treating ovulatory problems. The, the next step along the line is to consider using injections of um, hormone, a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone which directly acts on the ovary to produce the eggs or encourage the eggs to develop. But it has to be very carefully monitored with ultrasound scan because apart from the, the potential risk we were talking about earlier with um, the worry about um, possible cancer, although that's probably extremely small. The more, the more worrying risk actually is of causing multiple pregnancies and that is a definite risk with ovulation induction. So we have to be careful to monitor with ultrasound scan to make sure there aren't too many eggs developing in the ovaries. What are the minor side effects that women will have to be prepared to go through for this? Well, with simple ovulation induction, actually, there's often very little in the way of side effects because you're often just correcting um, something that's not happening naturally. Um, and some women with clomiphene will get a few hot flushes, um, but, but generally it's extremely well tolerated. And with the injections, some women who over-respond and are very sensitive to the drugs might get a problem called ovarian hyperstimulation, where their ovaries become very enlarged with way too many eggs developing and then the tummy can feel quite swollen and they can be bloated and if they're really uh, severely affected then they can, may need admission to hospital but that's extremely uncommon with simple ovulation induction. It's a bit more common after IVF treatment where you're pushing the ovaries a little harder to try and deliberately try and get several eggs to develop at the same time. Just if you would talk us through the success rates first of all of ovulation induction. Well, I think if you, the important thing is to compare it to um, the chances of achieving a pregnancy naturally. And the, the good thing about having a problem with ovulation is if, if you correct it and can get a woman ovulating each month in the same way that another one is doing naturally, then you put that woman's chance of conceiving back to exactly the same as if she had no problem at all. So after a year of ovulatory cycles, you would expect about 85% of couples to have achieved a pregnancy. That's very high, mm. isn't it? And what about the IVF route? Well, the IVF um, depends a lot on the age of the patient, um, or the success of the IVF depends a lot on the age of the patient um, undergoing treatment. Um, but you would expect um, around overall one in three patients to take home a baby after one IVF treatment cycle. 
Okay. Now, you mentioned um, earlier, you talked about the, the male problems. Can we just go back to, to that for a moment? Um, I don't think many people will know, I certainly didn't before I met you, to, that a sperm test would actually, pr could actually produce no sperm at all. In fact, that the semen could show, but there was no, no sperm within that test. Could, could you explain why there would be yeah. no sperm present? Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. Thankfully, it's not common, but, uh, and it can be quite a, a devastating blow when a, a man's given a result of um, a sperm a semen test which shows no sperm present. Occasionally, it's because there's been um, perhaps a febrile illness, like a bad bout of flu, a few weeks before, and it's just knocked sperm production on the head <laughs> temporarily, and then if you wait for a few weeks, it'll start to be produced again as the man recovers. Um, but more commonly, there is another reason underlying it. And the first thing to do is always to repeat the sample to make sure that it is genuinely the case that there are no sperm present. And then the reasons why there might not be is that there could be that the testes are producing plenty of sperm, quite normally, responding to all the normal hormonal stick signals, but that the sperm can't get out of the testes because there's a blockage in um, some of the pipes or tubes coming out of the testes. So what do you do with that? Well, you can either, sometimes it, it might be possible to refer them for specialist surgery to try and unblock the, the blockage and then allow the couple again a chance of conceiving naturally, which is always preferable. But if you can't undo the, the damage uh, or the blockage, then it's actually relatively simple to take sperm directly from the testis or the little tubules called the epididymis, which are close to the testis, um, um, with a fine needle and then use the sperm that you collect in that way to inject eggs in IVF or what's more commonly known, commonly known as ICSI treatment where you're injecting sperm um, into eggs. So that's the way you have a blockage um, of the sperm. Sometimes there are some men who have normal testes there that would be capable of responding but they're not getting the correct hormone signal from the brain and then they're relatively easy to treat because you can replace the hormones that are missing to stimulate the testes to produce the sperm. So in those two groups, it's quite um, easy to help those couples to achieve pregnancies, which is good news. The more difficult group to help are those where the testes themselves are either inherently not able to produce sperm or have been damaged in the past, perhaps by radiotherapy or chemotherapy or infection, and are no longer able to produce any sperm at all or, or, or perhaps only in very very small numbers but even in that group it's worth taking um, a little bit of tissue from the testes with small biopsies because in about a third of cases we can find some sperm there there's not enough to have got out into the semen sample but it's still you can find the occasional sperm within the testes and then you can use those sperm in the ICSI treatment. It sounds to me as that you'd rather have um, a problem with a man than, than a woman. It seems easier to solve. Would you say that's right? No, I oh. wouldn't overall. <laughs> no, so, um, so weigh up the problems. Because I think, it, I think it depends what the problem is in the, in the woman. If the problem is, I think one of the easiest problems to sort out is often an ovulation problem in the woman. Because that, Especially if it's linked with weight, etc. Yes, that, that's easy that to sort. you can sort that out more easily. You can get round some of the problems um, in the male partner, but it's very difficult to actually fundamentally change um, an abnormal sperm count or sperm that aren't moving very well. There's, there's very, very little we can do about that, so people often want us to try and prescribe drugs, but actually there aren't any drugs that make a difference in that situation, so sometimes couples find that frustrating. So I would say, although we can now get round a number of the male factor problems, it often involves quite high-tech assisted conception treatment, which na couples naturally would prefer often to avoid. Mm. Um, on the female side of things, there are other problems that we can treat, but again, not always with, with great success. Tubal problems in the, in the woman can sometimes be treated by surgery, um, the first thing you would do is if you thought that on the initial testing there might be a tubal problem, um, would be to generally recommend doing a laparoscopy if that hadn't been done already, to have a look at the tubes in a bit more detail and assess where the damage is and how severe the damage is. If the tubes are just mildly damaged, it can sometimes be possible to open them up and surgically remove scar tissue. If the tubes are very severely damaged, though, it, it may not be possible to open them up, but even if you can open them, they may not work or function properly because the lining of the tube is very, very specialised. 
and it's very important for the tube to be able to move the sperm and egg along in the tube. It has a very specialised transport function. So even if you can get some dye coming through the tube after surgery, it doesn't always mean it will work properly. Alison, this is a very long list of ifs. What if you can't identify? You've gone through the male, you've gone through the female. There's, there's nothing that you can really identify as, as the source of the problem. You've touched on it earlier, but really, as a short answer, what would you do with a couple like that? Um, with unexplained subfertility, you tend to start recommending assisted conception treatment. And um, we mentioned a little bit about intrauterine insemination earlier, but couples will often end up in that situation moving on towards IVF treatment, which has the advantage that not only does it give a higher success rate than intrauterine insemination treatments, but it also gives more diagnostic information because it's really the only way that we have of seeing how the woman's sperm, uh, woman's egg, sorry, mm -hmm. will interact with the man's sperm um, in the laboratory, whether fertilisation can happen at all, because until you see that, you don't necessarily know unless they've had a pregnancy previously. It also gives us information about what happens to the eggs once they've fertilised. So do they go on and divide and become relatively normal looking embryos or are they embryos that are rather slow in development or are perhaps rather fragmented and tending to break down as they're trying to divide and some of those things may be happening naturally so it may be that it will reveal some of the reasons why a couple perhaps hasn't achieved a pregnancy up to that point. This is all very enlightening thank you so much for talking to us and uh, I'm sure things will develop even further in the future. Thank, thank you. you very much Alison. Thank you.